ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ This evening I will speak on the practicality of living according to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's directions in the Shikshashtakam. How realistic is it to live in this world according to the principles of shikshashtaka the first verse in shikshashtaka describes the glories of sankirtan the second in the second chaitanya mahaprabhu describes more glories of the holy name of the process of chanting the holy name and laments what he perceives to be his lack of attachment to the holy name of Krishna so this is of course shikshashtaka is teaching us how we should approach the holy name of Krishna <clears throat> Now the third verse is of the Shikshashtaka is undoubtedly the most famous and particularly this verse Kaviraj Goswami as Krishnadas Kaviraj is the author of Chaitanya Charitamrita is often referred to he particularly stresses the importance of this verse he he says that we should take it and and string it on our neck make make a just like we have the kanthi mala so we should using this string this with the holy name just like this has a string with the holy name we should string this verse on our neck and i've seen some devotees they They, or there are some commercially produced neck bands with this verse so literally what is it konte kore e shloka it means it should be in the it may not necessarily mean to to speak it all the time but uh, to wear it literally but to to speak the holy name with this mood of trinada pisu nichena torora pisa hishnuna amani namana dena kirtani asada hari hi to consider oneself more humble than a blade of grass to uh to think of one's it literally means to think of oneself as much lower than grass sunich means much lower not just lower but much how low can you it can you get much lower than grass grass is trampled under foot without even thinking of it we we people tread on grass that's what grass is for right it's it's just there and you walk on it and tolerance well the grass has to be tolerant but the example is given as of a tree as tolerant as a tree not desiring for respect for oneself but giving respect to others in this way the holy name of krishna should be always chanted or the name of hari so it may not seem very realistic i mean how can you actually think yourself lower than grass how can you actually be more tolerant than a tree the example is given 
again by Krishna Kaviraj Goswami, the tree, people cut off the branches of the tree. The tree doesn't protest. Well, what if someone's to come and cut your arm off? Well, there are examples of that in Shastra, aren't there? There's the example of Ranti Dev, who was willing to give his whole body to, f- to feed a hawk to free a pigeon. So there are examples of, of such sacrifice. But how realistic is that? I mean, even for performing uh, Krishna conscious activities in this world, we need a body. Right? I mean, it is possible to practice Krishna consciousness in other forms, but in general, it's stated, what is that? Narotanu bhajane mool, as Narotanda says. Well, the human body is the, the, the basis of Krishna bhajan. So it's difficult, if you don't have a human body, to perform bhajan. And if, if we're so humble and tolerant, won't people mistreat us in practical dealings? How, how does that work out? I mean, we see that if we want to know, we should look to the example of our acharyas. We see that Srila Prabhupada was a businessman. If you are humble and tolerant in business, how are you going to do business? People will just cheat you. How can you live in this world? If you are very humble and tolerant, people will just, yeah, they'll miss. They'll take advantage. This is the world of exploitation. Uh, yeah, Prabhupada was doing business. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was a magistrate. So if you do, to be a magistrate, you have to, to do your duty as a magistrate. You have to, well, it literally means to judge others. So people, in the modern age, there's this, uh, in the Western world, the highly relative or theoretically relativistic Western world, there's this saying that you shouldn't be judgmental. Although just to say that is a judgmental statement. But, uh, but you know, talk about to judge others. Say, all right, you go to prison. So where's the tolerance? How can a judge, the judge will just tolerate. Well, this person... Killed 25 people, eh, just tolerate, tolerate. It's, he can't be a judge. He has to be intolerant of misbehavior of others. Punish it. Or, or pres- he doesn't personally punish it, he prescribes the punishment. We see, as Srila Prabhupada often pointed out, in the behavior of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that he was also uh, intolerant of people having cell phones going off in class. Well, I'm intolerant of it. Turn your cell phone off! Please. We have a rule that if anyone's cell phone rings, they should buy a Bible pizza. Yeah. I just take the money from them. Don't give them, <laughs> a, don't give them anything. Find them. What to do? It's like an impossible. Yeah, turn your cell phone off. No tolerance for cell phones going off. So as Prabhupada pointed out, that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was ready to kill Jagai and Madhai. He wasn't tolerant of their blasphemy. Not just blasphemy, but attack on Nityananda Prabhu. And uh, what is that? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Tarariva Sahishnuta, Sahishnuta. He also said, Mariada Langhan Shahite Napari, or something like that. Exact word. But the Shahite Napari. I cannot tolerate, he said, transgressions of Vaishnava etiquette. So, Chaitanya Mahabharu, how are we to understand? Is he a hypocrite? He's talking about a very high level of, or, or, or 
an idealistic level of practice which he himself doesn't follow. No, we shouldn't think like that. But we, we, uh, we will have to understand Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his followers from their perspective instead of from our perspective. The Vaishnava understanding of humility is not that of, of the Mayavadis pseudo, and other kinds of pseudo-spiritualists. <clears throat> Prakrita Sahajiyas, their humility, cringing humility, <laughs> like this, big show of humility. Often when I was living and traveling in Bengal, often people would come before me, uh, like falling down, crying, offering obeisances, saying, I am your dham, I am fallen. Or, so I'd say to them, well, if you're so humble and bowing down before me, you're ready to do what I say? Now how about giving up eating fish for a start? which uh, at that time, almost all Bengali who, Bengalis who identified themselves as Vaishnavas were accustomed to do. Now, due to the preaching of ISKCON, it's an awareness has come that it's not very good to do so, and many have stopped, which is quite an achievement. I mean, we could list among ISKCON's Achievements, some of the great achievements that so many Bengalis have given up eating fish. It's really quite an achievement that, that's come about. So, uh, humility in the, what, what is the Vaishnav definition? I, I treated this to some extent in that Sri Bhakti Siddhan Vaibhav in that book. Hanuman is famous as a great Vaishnava. Isn't it? So every Vaishnava is decorated with spiritual qualities. That verse we had the other day. Krishna Jatek Pancha Shatagun Vaishnav Sharire. What is that? Anyway, it's stated that all the qualities of a of Krishna's 56 qualities of Krishna. Not all of them, but some qualities of Krishna are not manifest in, in devotees. For instance, that Krishna, from Krishna's body, innumerable universes emanate. That's not, that's specifically for Krishna, not for devotees. But other qualities, 56 of them, are manifest in the personality of devotees. So Hanuman is not that he's not humble. Krishna incited Arjuna to fight. If Arjuna said, no, I want to be a Vaishnava, I want to be humble. And Krishna would have not accepted that argument. Or where is the humility and tolerance and saintliness in jumping into someone's kingdom uninvited and burning it down. Doesn't seem to be very saintly, does it? Well, who is this Hanuman that we're... What, what kind of person is it that we are worshipping? We're worshipping a perfect person for his saintly acts such as, or prominent among which is, burning Lanka. Not to be imitated, if you can jump to Lanka, then but there's no need to burn it nowadays. I mean, already it's burned up. It's already been burned up enough recently with the civil war and everything. So how is how is all anyway? How is this to be understood? What what is the humility? What is the tolerance? What is the saintly behavior? How is that defined or understood? Or how are we to emulate that? If, we, if our examples are Hanuman, 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, who was ready to burn, uh, to uh, kill Jagai and Madhai, was Nityananda interceded on their behalf. So maybe Nityananda is a better Vaishnava than Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Well, if we think like that, that's offensive also. How are we to, un- how do- are we to understand this and practically apply it in our lives? The point is that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is speaking from the perspective of Vaishnava, in which Krishna's happiness is central. That's the central point. Not as, not according to the definitions of this material world. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu speaks of humility, he speaks of that in relation to Krishna. When we speak of humi- our conception of, or our concept of humility in this world is uh, how to, actually a concept of everything in this world is how to avoid Krishna. So the humility of, as conceived of in non-Krishna consciousness is just another form of rascaldom. It's just a, it's an apparently saintly form of avoiding Krishna, that's all. And tolerance and all supposedly good qualities are all simply uh, dramas, pantomimes of saintliness, parodies of saintliness for persons attempting to of, of, or attempting to show themselves as being saintly but avoiding Krishna. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's humility is in relationship with Krishna. Arjuna was incited to become a humble man and not be a puffed up rascal by attempting to avoid the fight and thinking that he had a better opinion than Krishna. So he followed Krishna's directive and in this way he exercised the true uh, propensity of the jiva to act according to Krishna's desire. Karishe vachanam tava. Not karishe vachanam mama. I'll, I will. I have now decided, Krishna. I, well, that's what he said before. Nayotsya. He, he told Krishna, I will not fight. I'm not going to fight. That was offensive. Of course, Arjuna was just taking this position temporarily. But to standing before Krishna and telling him, I've made up my mind, I'm going to do what I, I know what's right, and I'm not going to fight. That was offensive, seeing as Krishna himself had come to assist Arjuna. Krishna was clearly in favor of the fight. He, he wanted that to take place. Krishna, he was there and Arjuna, he was directly in, in front of Arjuna and Arjuna thought that he had a better idea than Krishna. Hey Krishna, you have come. everyone's come here and you're all wrong. I'm right. I've got it right. I know what is dharma better than you and I'm not going to fight. So his apparent saintliness was actually an exhibition of impudence. Dharshtya, that's called. I don't know if you have that word in your language. That was not, that was not saintliness. Now and then the question may come, well, why would Krishna want to kill anyone? Well, Krishna kills everyone anyway in this world. Grasishnu Prabhavishnu Cha. He devours and develops everything. You may say, well, what kind of God is that? Well, actually, he doesn't kill, but uh, we kill ourselves, or we put ourselves in a situation. We subject ourselves to a situation. We subject ourselves to this situation. Purusha Sukhadukhanam. Man is the architect of his own fortune. 
our happiness and distress in this material world is caused by ourselves. We are the cause of our distress and so-called happiness in this material world. And Krishna effects that. He doesn't, he's not actually killing anyone, but the change of body, which is known as death in this world, is affected by Krishna, or more accurately by his energies, the material energy. So, uh, there was a need at that time, Krishna saw that there was a need for removing the sinful kshatriyas of the world and he wanted Arjuna to be the instrument for doing that. So Arjuna ultimately came to the point of humility by agreeing to do what Krishna says. And this is humility. This is actual humility. To accept Krishna's order. Which may mean also appearing to execute Krishna's order and thus be humble. Humble on the platform of the jiva. Surrendering to Krishna. One may have to appear not humble in the eyes of materialistic people. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's order is Jare Deko Tare Koha Krishna Upadesh. Preach the message of Krishna. So to do that, one may appear... one. To preach, one has to take the position of apparently not being humble. That I know something that you don't know. I know something. I can tell you what you should do. And this doesn't appear very humble. That's not humble. Then, but if, there's, if, if everyone is so humble that they don't preach, what kind of humility is that? That's useless it's a useless travesty of humility. Therefore, in commenting on this, Jare Deko Tare Koha Krishna Upadesh, Bhakti Siddhan Sarsar Thakur says that one should not think that I'm such an advanced devotee, therefore I'm, I'm, a, I'm above accepting disciples. Because if you accept disciples, you have to be apparently not humble with them. Guru means you have to tell them, you rascal. You have to take a superior position. But Bhaktisthan Sarasar Thakur says that one should not think I am a very advanced devotee, therefore I should not... One should give up the mentality of thinking I am a very advanced devotee and therefore uh, I should not accept any disciples. Unfortunately, this... Uh, in the editing of this, when Prabhupada translated this, it got messed up by the editors. So it comes out that Prabhupada says, one should not accept any disciples. Whereas it actually it should be, one should not have the mentality by, by which one thinks one should not accept any disciples. So that's one of the favorite quotes from the Ritvik Vadi party. But it was actually an editor's mistake. You know that where it says, one should not accept any disciples? Famously quoted by them. But it's actually that one should give up the mentality by which one thinks one should not accept any disciples. In other words, one should accept disciples. Because that's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's instruction. Amar Agyai Guru Hoya Tara Edesh. On my order, be a guru and deliver this land. So it may appear contradictory. Bhaktisthan Sarsar Thakur addressed this apparent contradiction in one famous lecture, he uh, uh, addressed the apparent contradiction of being a guru and simultaneously being a Vaishnava. And he's, he stated, or the, the, the paradox, he stated that one who becomes a guru ceases to be a Vaishnava. <laughs> The Vaishnava always thinks himself lower than all others, but a guru has to take a superior position to others. So, one who becomes a guru ceases to be a Vaishnava, but if one does not become a guru, then the parampara cannot continue. And the service to Krishna, which he has instituted in this world, 
by speaking Bhagavad Gita, that is lost. So it's a typical paradox. That the, that's the stuff of Mahabharata. It's the stuff of, or the principle on which Bhagavad Gita was spoken. That if you do, if you perform an action, then some principle of dharma will be broken. But if you don't perform it, some principle, another principle of dharma will also be broken. Arjuna thought, that, well, if I fight, dharma will be spoiled by killing our gurus. And if I don't fight, then also dharma will be spoiled because I'm a kshatriya and it's my dharma to fight. I'm just giving two reasons. There are many reasons on both sides. So this dharma sankat is the, it's the stuff of Mahabharata and Ramayana. And how to apply the principles of dharma in actual life. So how well Krishna gives the key to that Saradhaman Parityaja Mami Kamsharnam Raja. Give up all other dharmas and just surrender to me. This has to be understood. This famous verse also has to be understood contextually because it's not actually not possible for the jiva to give up all dharmas. It's it's actually impossible because everything has its dharma. And the jivas Nitya dharma, sanatan dharma, is that of being a servant to Krishna. And that is not possible to give up that dharma. It's, one can attempt to, well that's what everyone does in the material world. They, they attempt to give up the dharma of serving Krishna and they adopt so many other dharmas. I am a kshatriya, I am a brahmana. There are so many other dharmas which are adopted. But Krishna says, to give up all those dharmas and simply surrender to me. So that's the meaning of Sarvathaman Parityaja, to accept our actual dharma of being a servant of Krishna, which means to follow his order. And following his order, uh, that inevitably contradicts all the dharmas of this world, including the dharma of... Or or the understanding of humility. According to materialistic understanding, humility means uh, submission to others, but a devotee doesn't submit to those who do not submit to Krishna. A devotee submits to Krishna and his representatives. So if a devotee is, has to choose between which he has to all the time, submitting to Krishna or submitting to persons who are envious of Krishna. He has to submit to Krishna. That is his humility, which materialistic people cannot understand. They cannot understand anything properly. It is impossible to understand anything properly unless we understand our relationship with Krishna as his servant. That's why every single word has that we know has to be redefined and re-understood. Our whole thinking process has to be totally revamped if we are actually enter, to enter into Krishna. What are you doing? Looking at the word revamp? It means like refurbish, or to totally redecorate it. Or, yeah, look it up then. Revamp. What does the Sri Dictionary say? Or... Should we look up the Vaishnav dictionary? <laughs> it means to uh, patch up or restore. Yeah, maybe that's not the best word. Refurbish. Well, it's something like taking out the uh, the petrol engine and putting in and uh, what's this compressed gas engine? It's like the car runs on in the same way, but it's a different system altogether. So a devotee lives in this world and may appear to be a person of this world, but he's got a different mentality altogether. So everything should be understood in connection with Krishna. Humility means to follow Krishna's instruction. Among them, one of them, which is we receive via Rupa Goswami, 
in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Nectar of Devotion, is that a devotee should not be negligent in worldly dealings. So why not, a devotee cannot claim, well, I'm following Krishna, and therefore uh, he, uh, I can do whatever I like. I, I'm not following any rules of the world. I'll drive, well, I was going to say, we should drive on the right side of the road, but in India that's not always followed anyway. But theoretically, you should drive on the left side of the road. If you drive on the wrong side of the road and as a consequence happen to kill someone, you can't claim, well, I'm a devotee of Krishna, so I can drive wherever I like. It, it won't be accepted. So, uh, humility, does in following Krishna, it doesn't mean some fanaticism. One should, also, one should know how to represent Krishna in this world. So humility, tolerance. One should be tolerant for one's own sake, but one should not tolerate blasphemy of devotees. One should not tolerate uh, that Krishna and his teachings are misrepresented. Srila Prabhupada became very angry. That's when, just to give one example, in Varda, in which is in MP, I believe, or Maharashtra, Maharashtra, near the border with MP, uh, Prabhupada was invited to a Gita Samelan with many of the famous Hindi-speaking Gita Pravaktas, uh, speakers of Bhagavad Gita, or religious leaders, and not on the stage, but behind the stage, they were all gathered, and no doubt they would have all been prepared to praise Prabhupada for his work in spreading Bhagavad Gita, but Prabhupada just shouted at all of them. He was very angry with all of them. Why are you misrepresenting Bhagavad Gita? Why are you teaching Bhagavad Gita without reference to Krishna? So Srila Prabhupada is not tolerant of the Mayavadis. This idea that, well, it's all right, it's okay. Nothing wrong, it's quite nice. No, Prabhupada, he didn't tolerate that. Should we also do like that? Some would say no. We should be nice with the Mayavadis. Well, they're nice. Mayavadis are nice. They smile. They hold flowers. They're peaceful. I mean, some of them. Many of them are gentle, saintly people. They appear to have all good qualities, but actually they're all rascals. Because they are envious of Krishna. Their philosophy is concocted to cast Krishna as literally a non-entity. There is Krishna is Maya. That's why they're called Mayavadis. So tolerance. Well, at the same time, we see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he met Sarvabhoma Bhatta Acharya. He didn't. Of course, his sannyas danda had already been broken by Nityananda Prabhu, but he still had his, had his kamandalu. He could have, he could have hit Sarvabhoma on the head with his kamandalu, but he didn't. He he tolerantly listened to Sarvabhoma for seven days, and then defeated his philosophy. It's very difficult in the modern age to to defeat Mayavad philosophy because the neo Mayavadis they don't know it anyway. They don't really have any philosophy and they don't have any philosophical system or understanding of any philosophy or any system of, of argument. So even if you point out that everything they say is completely rubbish, which isn't very difficult to do, uh, they just say, words, words. As long as it's not pointed out their words are all rubbish, they go on speaking it. When it's pointed out that what they're saying is all rubbish, then they just say, Words, words, as if somehow or other there's something wrong with words. So they're not, they're not very sincere or, or uh, honest 
or even uh, intelligent in most cases. So uh, it's very difficult to argue with them because they have no fixed platform. Asatyam apratishtam. They don't have any fixed platform of argument. I mean, at least Sarvabhoma, they had the platform of at least superficially accepting Ved Vedanta. But the modern Mayavadis, it's, there's, it's nowhere. It's just whatever funny idea comes up in their head. And we see these neo-Mayavadis, that they can, they can brazenly speak one thing, one minute, and then when you, when you point out the foolishness in that, they'll just say something else, that's all. They have no fixed position. So tolerance does not mean tolerance of Mayavad. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, he didn't tolerate, he, he didn't necessarily uh, physically beat Mayavadis, but he, he didn't like their philosophy. And even so-called Vaishnavas, Bhakti Siddhanta Viruddha, Arasabhas, Shunile, Prabhur, Chete, Nahoyo, Ula. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was not happy to hear even so-called Vaishnavas who spoke against the proper conclusions of bhakti. Uh, or who spoke with inappropriate mixing of rasa, emotional taste. Rasa can be defined as emotional taste. So, amanina, manadena, is it practical or to give uh, respect to others and not accept respect for oneself? Certainly a Vaishnava should not accept respect for himself. If he does, he's finished. As soon as one desires respect for oneself, one is finished. If one desires praise, ah, praise, I did so much. I'm, I'm so brilliant, you should all praise me. If one thinks like that, he's finished. He may think, well, who's this? Who, who can speak like that sitting on a big seat above everyone else? Is that not accepting honor for, for oneself? But actually, if, if uh, a Vaishnava or an aspiring Vaishnava accepts respect for himself, his spiritual life is finished. If he becomes desirous of praise, then very quickly all the bad propensities of non-Vaishnavas, which is headed by desiring to see oneself as important, that enters the heart and contaminates it. Bhaktivinoda Thakur sings, Amito Vaishnava e buddhi hoile amani nahabhavami If I think I am a Vaishnava, then I'll become Puffed up. Pratishta asha ashi hridoi dushi be hoibo niroyagami. Then the desire for prestige, honor, praise will enter my heart and contaminate it, and I'll become a candidate for going to hell. One ceases to be a Vaishnava if one desires praise. And one should be ready to praise others, but who should one praise? One should, or one should be ready to offer respect to others. We see that Chaitanya Mahabharu offered respect to Sarvabhoma, but he didn't offer any respect to his philosophy. He's, he said, when Sarvabhoma said that, well, you're just sitting and listening for seven days, so I can't understand whether you, I mean, you should say something. Sarvabhoma said to Chaitanya Mahabharu, I can't understand whether... Whether, I can't understand whether you understand it or not, because you don't say anything. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I understand it very well. I understand Vedanta very well, but I don't understand anything that you're saying, because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, he point blank or bluntly told Sarvabhoma that what you're saying doesn't make any sense, which is a big shock for Sarvabhoma, because... He didn't expect that. And then there was some discussion. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Kundan, he broke all the theories of Sarvabhoma. He, when there was debate, he didn't say, 
Just like in nowadays in modern empathetic listening, you, you're supposed to say, well, that's a very good point. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he didn't say that. He said, no, that's a very bad point. Everything you say is rubbish. But then he showed from Shastra, from Shastra and logic, how everything that Sarvabhoma said is rubbish. So I wanted to speak more on applying Shikshastra in our lives, but I only touched the third verse. The fourth verse is also... I mean, this could be discussed more and more also. But nadhanam, najanam, nasundarim, kavitam va jagadisha kamaya, mama janmani janmani shvare bhavatad bhakti rahaitu kitvai. Is it possible to desire a haituki bhakti or bhakti without any cause or without any motive while one is in this world one is motive while one is in this world especially vikrihastas if they say nadhanam i don't want any wealth and the wife will say what's going on we need some money here That was the case of uh, Tukaram in Maharashtra. If everyone became like Tukaram, then we'd have a lot of discontent wives. Or in these days, they just get divorced. There was no divorce allowed in those days. So Tukaram's wife had to put up with him. So uh, if one is a householder, then one should have some monetary sense. We, we find in Chaitanya Charitamrita, again, one should not be neglectful in worldly dealings. Vasudev Datta, a great devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, was very liberal. He wanted to deliver all the conditioned souls. He was not a very good manager of wealth as you might expect a datta to be, a kayasta class. They're generally involved in wealth administration and all these kind of things. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur also came, superficially came in the datta family, Kedarnath datta. So they're expected to be very pragmatic, worldly-minded people. Lobhi kayashta, that's also described Chaitanya Charitamrita, greedy kayastas. <clears throat> so Vasudev Datta, he was very liberal by nature, and he didn't, whatever money came, he didn't look after it properly. So his family life wasn't going on very well. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you can imagine, any money comes and then immediately just, all right, don't keep it. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appointed Shiva Ananda Sen, who was very practical, who managed Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's uh, devotees to go and visit him every year. That's a big thing to manage going from Bengal to Orissa, managing a yatra. It's uh, so many arrangements have to be made. So Shivananda Sena was very practical in this regard. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu put Shivananda Sena in charge of Vasudev Datta's family life. He became his financial advisor. Because Shivananda Sena was very practical. They're both pure devotees, but they had different personalities. They're both Highly, ad, I mean, the personal associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And very close and dear associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But one was impractical in worldly affairs. Demonstrating one quality of a pure devotee, of non-attachment to wealth. But Shivananda saying he... Uh, demonstrated non-attachment to wealth by using it very carefully in Krishna's service. Which is 
more practical, especially for a preaching movement. Srila Prabhupada was very uh, concerned, very dismissive of, of wastage of money. Everything should be, nothing should be wasted. The light should be turned off. Even the water is dripping from a tap. That uh, one devotee said that if, if the water drab in, in Mayapur, is Bhavananda who was managing that. He said that if the, wa- if the water was dripping from a trap, tap, one drop in 24 hours, Prabhupada would be there when the drop was dropping and would chastise the managers. And not even the tap on the ISKCON property, once Srila Prabhupada was walking in Chicago, I believe it was, and saw someone else's tap is dripping and told them, go and turn it off. There are many lessons to be learned from this. A a devotee doesn't desire wealth, but his attitude, Bhakti no Thakur in family life, uh, I can't remember, but exactly the words, in Sharanagati that song comes, that Uparajibo Dhan, I will earn wealth for the sake of all my family affairs, earning wealth, uh, Everything is to be done with the idea that the family is only for Krishna's pleasure. Now, of course, it's easy to... We have to be careful we don't just say that and cheat ourselves. Just like we'll find there are so many people, at least previously in India, who used to claim to be karma yogis. Whereas actually they're just karmis. They say, oh, I'm a karma yogi. I'm doing my business and I'm a karma yogi. But actually they're just karmis. They were interested in profit for themselves. They would give a little bit in charity. But most of the karma was yukta, um, engaged in yoga with their own family affairs. So that's not karma yoga. So if actually one's family life is only for the pleasure of Krishna, then uh, earning money and all other activities, uh, they become fully spiritual. Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavya, Brahmagnao, Brahmanahutam, Brahmanahutam, Brahmaivatena Gandavyam, Brahma Karma Samadina. Just like in a sacrifice, everything becomes spiritualized if it's offered for Krishna. The, uh, the ghee the spoon, the performer, <coughs> so the activity. So all activities become spiritualized if they're actually offered fully for the pleasure of Krishna. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he did that. He performed his family duties. He went to work, but then he would see how many books he wrote. Writing books, and what quality of books writing books, personally preaching and organizing preaching programs, uh, associating with devotees, spend time every day chanting with devotees, chanting on beads, uh, reciting Chaitanya Charitamrita and Srimad Bhagavatam. He, w- he was actually fully absorbed in Krishna's service, even in family life. So that's the ideal Otherwise, if one doesn't, if one's not actually absorbed in Krishna's service, then one will desire wealth. Janam again means followers and prestige. People will praise me. Beautiful women. One will be attracted to mundane uh, male-female interactions, uh, and the whole material world will seem desirable to a person who does not desire pure devotional service to Krishna. So, uh, these understandings should be there. Then it's possible. It, it, it may seem, how is it possible? Nayanam galada shudharaya Tears will flow from the eyes gushing gushing out 
Sometimes devotees become very anxious to hear about the very intimate pastimes of Radha and Krishna, contemplating which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would cry in such a way that tears would come out from his eyes, gushing out like a like from a hose. But it's appropriate for devotees to, rather than concentrate on such pastimes, concentrate on the attitude in Krishna consciousness which makes one eligible to enter that mood, which is Mama Durdai, what is that? Durdaiva Midrishami Hajani Na Nuraga. Why don't I have taste for the holy name due to offenses in chanting? Because I'm attached to Dhanjan, Sundari, and everything else in this material world, therefore we don't have taste for the holy name. So these should be considered. I am an eternal servant of Krishna, but I've fallen into this material world. So... Uh, we worship Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Yugayatam Nimeshena Chakshusha Pravishayatam Shunyayatam Jagat Sarvam Govinda Virahename. We worship this Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's feeling of separation from Krishna in which a moment seems like twelve years. We don't imitate that. We should uh, work on, instead of imitating that, we should work on. Uh, relinquishing all mundane desires for money, wealth, followers or anything in this material world and simply identify ourselves as the eternal servant of Krishna. So I'm going through a little quickly because I'm supposed to finish now. But this... Uh, this Aslishava padaratam pinashtu mama darshanan marmahatam kurotuva yatatata va vidatatu lampato mat prananatas tu sa evanapara. This seems very difficult that Krishna, even if you trample me, crush me, literally pulverize me, I still accept you as my Lord in all circumstances the Lord of my life, whatever you do to me. So how, how can we accept this? It's generally people's faith in God is increased by what he does for them. What, what can God do for you? I, I chanting Hare Krishna, I have so many, pr people come to Krishna for that. Artha, Artarti, those who are distressed and desirous of money, they go to Krishna. Distressed means my sense gratification is impeded. I'm suffering in so many ways. Krishna, help me. So that's a pious person. But such a person, in the, they cannot pray to Krishna. That Ashli Shava Padaratam. They're praying. Dhanjan, you give me all these things. Isn't it? If we have, if we're distressed or desirous of wealth, we're going to Krishna praying. For Dhanjan Sundari and uh, wealth, position, enjoyment of this material world. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, don't. Don't think like that. I don't desire these things. To the extent that if we are g given distress, we are prepared to uh, accept that unquestioningly in Krishna's service. People come to Krishna, relieve me from distress. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that even if you give me terrible distress, which in his estimation, the worst distress, is that if Krishna doesn't show himself to me, the person approaching Krishna, artha, artharti, distressed or desirous of wealth, they approach Krishna, they don't, they don't particularly want to see Krishna, but they want something from Krishna. Whereas a pure devotee's attitude is that I, I just want to see you, but even if you don't show yourself to me, which is the worst distress for me, still, unquestioningly, un with unconditionally, you are the Lord of my life. This is a great test.
Krishna may test us like this. You have to be ready for that. That's the... We talk about Vraja Bhakti. But this is the qualification to enter Vraja Bhakti. That we're devoid of any personal desire or even we're prepared to accept all distress on Krishna's behalf. That's why, you see, Srila Prabhupada, he, it appeared that he left Vrindavan, but actually he exhibited the spirit of Vrindavan in accepting all kinds of difficulties to fulfill Krishna's desire. So really Prabhupada was living in Vrindavan. By going outside Vrindavan and preaching Krishna consciousness, he was actually exhibiting the mood of Vrindavan in, to the highest extent, which persons who think that just living there, or apparently living there, without that consciousness of full surrender to Krishna, they, they're not living in Vrindavan in the way that Prabhupada did by apparently leaving Vrindavan. So to accept all this stress on behalf of Krishna can be difficult, but that's the only way to really be a devotee. This is what Srimad Bhagavatam teaches us again and again. Uh, Ambarish Maharaj, he he accepted this, his sahishnuta, his tolerance. This is Torah uh, sahishnuta that a devotee is willing to accept all kinds of distress and not say, well, Krishna, come on, what's going on? I'm your devotee. Why don't you look after me? But he, f he feels that what, whatever Krishna does to me, that that's his mercy on me. Whatever birth I may get as a result of my... As a result, whatever I get is a result of my sinful activities. Krishna is very kind to me. He's purifying me. That is the attitude of a devotee. Difficult to emulate, but it is, that's what we are being taught. One devotee, he uh, related, one, one of my godbrothers, that he's only, dealing, he's only dealing with Prabhupada every single time Prabhupada chastised him. But he, he said that looking back on that, I can understand that was for my purification. If Prabhupada hadn't done that to me, then, uh, what did he say? He said, I, I may not have taken Prabhupada so seriously. And that's very difficult. Not every devotee is ready to accept that. But if we're not ready to accept that, of course, it's Prabhupada, not Krishna. But it is. We should see that this is... Krishna's mercy on me, His divine grace, Krishna Kripa Sri Murti. The very form of Krishna's mercy is the pure devotee, spiritual master. So there, generally we think, oh, Guru, someone very, you have all the, the, the Bangalore is, outside of Bengal is the capital of bogus gurus. So you have so many bogus gurus, gurus hanging around here. Apart from the uh, pollution, from the Traffic, you have the bogus guru pollution. So uh, you, you have this Sri Sri fellow who's, you know, he's just like the uh, stereotype of a bogus guru. He's like he studied everything a bogus guru should be, and like that. He smiles, he's nice, he giggles. <laughs> He speaks in an effeminate voice. Everything a bogus guru. He's he's got it down. He's he's made a perfect job, and he's doing a he's doing an excellent job of being a bogus guru. I mean, just ex you you exactly fits the bill of a bogus guru. So he, he smiles. He's nice. He talks about love, compassion, be nice, and all vague things. Very nice. So, uh, to, for our great good fortune, Prabhupada wasn't a nice guru. <laughs> Not the stereotype of a nice guru, but he was actually nice in as much as he lived the Vaishnav principle of interacting with others in a way that can bring them to the point of 
accepting Krishna as he is. Surrender to Krishna means accepting Krishna as he is, not as we think he should be or not as we, not that Krishna should be what I want him to be, but that we are willing to accept Krishna in any way, whatever way he presents himself to us. So he may think, well, that's, that's too much. What if Krishna mistreats us? But surrender is based on, surrender to Krishna is based on the trust that Krishna will never mistreat us, even if apparently he does so. So these are very deep points to understand. The eighth verse of Shikshashtaka is very high understanding, no doubt. But that is what Chaitanya Mahabharu teaches us. I don't have more time to elaborate, although it's a very deep topic and a very sweet topic. How the devotees are fully surrendered to Krishna, even apparently against their own self-interest. But one should understand that my this is the essence of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings and of all the Shastra, that our real self-interest is in, is in understanding that our, we have no self-identity, we have no existence separate from that of Krishna. So we should act in harmony with Krishna's desires. We should do what he wants rather than what we want. So, Hare Krishna. I'll finish there. It's a vast topic. <laughs> Living Shikshashtaka. Is it practical in the material world? No. Not very practical. If we are to be a first class materialist, then we should never recite the Shikshashtaka. If we are to be a devotee, then we should ch chant the Shikshashtaka and live according to that. Maybe not very practical for living in this material world. What will happen if I become a devotee? Then I'll lose my desire to become a, a, a top computer engineer or famous. Uh, yeah. May spoil your material. Uh, yeah. This Krishna consciousness spoils your material life. You might also, they might go on with that. But generally devotees, see they're not ambitious. They don't have material ambitions. So we may spoil your whole material life. That's great, isn't it? Because material life means birth, death, old age and disease. Material